Nation Talks. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60, and I guarantee you exciting minutes. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Today, the so-called Secretary of State for Scotland turned up for Scottish questions and announced that he had not brought with him an answer to a written question. You must assume that the dog ate it or some other such calamity. Uh, whatever, the poor man was there left mute, uh, which, which in fact made him more eloquent than he's been in many times in the past. Um, the other news tonight, and perhaps our guests might be uh, prepared to talk about this, is that we gather that the Croydon, Croydon Council, uh, to be precise, has filed for a 114 notice to signify that effectively the council is bankrupt. So we now have a bankrupt council in the UK. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, as I said, we have another great guest tonight, and I'm really excited that she's able to join us. Tonight, the TNT show welcomes Dot Jessiman. London-born Dot is a founder member of New Scots for Independence. She is also a leading light in the NEC. And we are taking your questions live. We'll make use of that. We've already had some coming in. Don't be frightened. This is your show, The Nation Talks, and we talk to some degree based upon the questions that you submit, and we try and get answers to your questions. So in many respects, this is your show. So moving to our guest tonight, The Nation Talks to Dot Jessamine. How are you, Dot? How are you coping with the pandemic? Well, really rather well, because we live four miles from the nearest village. Um, and in the summer, we tend to stay on site. So up to now, apart from having to go shopping and to take all those sort of precautions when we do, and not being able to bring people in for barbecues and lunches and things like that, um, it's hardly touched us. Whether that is going to be continue to be true in the winter when everything closes in on us and we rely on going out yeah. is another that matter. Yeah. Do, do you find that your, your, where you live is badly affected by snow, for example, or adverse weather conditions? Well, yes, not so much in recent years um, uh, where we, but I mean, for years until we got sort of the effects of um, global warming, we were cut off every winter. Um, at some stage or another. Um, we live sort of 400, 400 feet up, um, and there's really nothing between us and Spitsburg. And if the northeast wind is blowing, we know it. <laughs> yeah, I thought Kenross was windy. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background, Dot. You, you, you've described yourself as a cockney. Uh, 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 and at one time you, you did lots of interesting work in housing in London. Uh, th think about that news tonight about crime going bankrupt. Uh, what, what's your take on the work that you did and what that tells you about the UK generally? Well, basically what I did was I ran the building sites programme for the Greater London Council, which was providing everything that was needed to get something which was covered in housing, and almost every site in London is covered in housing. You have to pull them down and, and re, re, redevelop. And to take it from the point where it was a twinkle in somebody's eye right the way through to you hand it over a cleared site to the architect, anything that got in the way of progressing it within the programme was my job to try and sort out. Uh, it was the thing that really, in some ways, led to my joining the SNP when I did finally, because um, I learned, I knew more than I ever want to know about why the UK doesn't work. And uh, it was my daily job to wriggle my way through the, all the, the, the mess that comes from working within a, a, a group of arrangements, a structure, which is completely out of date and which nobody has the slightest intention of doing anything to improve. And the thought that if you voted to be independent, you could actually get clear of this, this back-looking 
mess. <laughs> I, to me, it, the idea was that you should grab the chance like mad and run like hell, which is part of the reason why I joined the, the SMP. It also is one of the reasons why I've always had very strong doubts about devolution. Yes, it was a necessary step. Yes, it achieved what Alec always said it would achieve, which was showing people that we could we could manage. But uh, London was developed in a way where you had councils who did a lot of all the we had councils and you had the GLC, which was the sort of the, the, the regional power. When they set up the um, when they set up the, uh, the, the GLC as opposed to the old LCC, they did it in a way in which, which was intended to ensure that the Conservatives, for the first time in many years, got a look in. And in doing so, they set up things, housing was one of them, where yeah. the division between the council's work and our work was not clear. And yeah. you find this exactly. Uh, uh, you can see it in taxation. You can see it in welfare. This is exactly what devolution in Scotland does as well. And it's a mess and it's dreadful. It gives people the chance to run away from taking responsibility. Really? Did you find, and you found that being a, a, a recurrent theme? Yeah. But, did you think the complexity was deliberately built in? Uh, I think, uh, no, I, I think it was vague. I think it was just that it, ju it was just bad. It, it was just, they didn't think it mattered, to be clear. Yeah. The, net, the net result was that it gives everybody the opportunity to have a lovely time and arguing about who's responsible for what. Yeah. Yeah. And all gets done, yeah. and I'm sure that the I'm sure that the ministers in the Scottish government who are dealing with these devolved matters are finding exactly the same. You mean you mean that you, it's never it's not clear uh, what Westminster needs to do and what Scotland needs to do? Yes, that's it. I mean, it, look at um, uh, no, what, what's the thing? Always, I always think it's, it's one of the taxation things where the demarcation line is is really not clear. That, well, yes, it is. It's to do with if you look at taxation, we do personal taxation, but not personal allowances. Now, that to me is absolutely typical of the sort of thing that you you do, and very often it comes about as a result not just of sloppy thinking, but also whim. You'll get, you get. I don't think people realise that you get these enormous meetings where everybody sends not just a departmental representative, but a representative of every damn section in the department, and they all have to have their little sentence in the in the in the thing. You need to be very very tough indeed to to produce a good brief out of that, and the, the result is is muddle. Yeah. It, it, it's a great pity, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 just a crazy, crazy arrangement. Uh, so, you were handling what twenty two thousand houses at one time. Is that is that the case? Yeah, that was the that was the amount when I started. They wanted to put it up. We had enough. Uh, we had enough land lying around and not being used quickly enough, yeah. as all these arguments developed. Yeah. Um, to produce for 10 years, I think it was, they said, they thought 60,000. I think that was over-optimistic. I think 40 would have been there. But it was lying there, and it was it was tied up in disputes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not at all uncommon when it comes to uh, land and buildings. Uh, no, it's not. But it was taken, it was taken beyond the level. It... it there wasn't a program. Yeah. The first GLC housing program was me uh, when I took over, crawling around my, my sitting room floor with a roll with about 16 coloured pens and a roll of wallpaper lining. And I then took this to the real McCoy, who were the, the proper programmers who did the roads program and did the sort of real thing. But that, that was the first time anybody had actually slotted the various bits together and seen them as complementary to one another, if you know what I mean. And do you, I, think, 
150 sites. Yeah, that sounds dreadful. Do you think things have progressed or regressed since then? Have they gotten worse or better? Well, I don't know. If you look at what happened with the Scottish Parliament, I would say that there was something rather similar going on there. I mean, I would, I would have been amazed had it gone through simply and under budget and all the rest of it. I mean, apart from the fact that the, the, the sum itself was obviously ludicrous, yeah. the overall sum that they set in the first place. Um, do you know what I mean? It, 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 but from the inside, um, I would have been astounded if things had gone from smoothly. They didn't. Yeah. Well, let's, we may come back to that, but let, let's focus for a little bit on uh, your views on Section 30, uh, why it might work and why it possibly doesn't work and what you think ought to be done now in terms of moving the constitutional debate forward in Scotland? Well, I think with Section 30, there really isn't any point in, in, um, in going into it too far at the moment, because it is quite clear that the 2014 arrangement is not going to operate this time, and that the UK government is not going to not only the UK government is not going to, but the opposition parties, were they the government, they are not going to grant a Section 30 because they know there's a very good chance that a referendum will in fact lead to a yes result. It's certainly they're not dismissing it the way that um, uh, was done last time when they, th they gave it to us because they thought we weren't going to, we weren't going to win. Yeah. Um, and so... I think if you put it, I'd put it stronger than that. I'd say not only are we not going to get it, but if you were the UK Premier, you, your job is to look after the interests of the United Kingdom. You are therefore, it, it's not just a question of you don't want to give a, 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 a Section 30 consent. Your duty is, is not to give it because basically um, your responsibility is to look after the UK. And if Scotland secedes, the UK is going to be in a, a position which is, gives, it has less prestige and a, and a dodgier economy. So, I mean, they're not going to say yes. So you just wipe that out. Which was the point, really, I started from when we started looking at this at a, an alternative route. Um, you, it's not acceptable to say we just keep on trying and we have another mandate and we have another mandate and we keep on trying. It, you've got to make a political judgment that it's not going to work and say, well, in that case, we have either got to admit that we're not going to go for independence. And I, this is where I think the government has been, not been honest with people. That is, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying that it is at least a possibility that if we, if we hone, in, hone in totally on Section 30, we could not get a referendum at all um, under Section 30. And therefore, that to me means that you've got to find another way. Yeah. And at that point, <laughs> you start thinking about, well, what sort of other way has it got to be? Yeah, and it's, yeah they seemed to me that that was political, that what you wanted was something that the, the Scottish government um, could initiate itself without needing permission, and it could control all the way through the, the, the political process of referendum and all the rest of it, and which had a, um, a sufficiently convincing form of legal underpinning yeah. should it to first of all to um be acceptable to the uh electorate as valid and to survive uh, a possible challenge in court in um so <laughs> we also i've always thought that when you get a situation which has got clouded it's got the accretions of years, you know, bits added, bits taken away. The best thing to do is to go back to square one and see the point at which the situation was absolutely clear. Absolutely clear. And to me, that point was the treaty. And I emphasise the treaty, not the act. The act, to my mind, was the 18th century interpretation of the treaty. And so that was the sort of way I was looking. And I found... When you say treaty, what specifically are you referring to? 
the Treaty of Union as opposed to the Act of Union. Right. And the difference between... See, the thing at which the two governments agreed on a form of... Uh, on, on a treaty. They agreed on a way of doing things, and then that was interpreted in both parliaments in, 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 in the Act, which was then set up. So what, um, what, in the end, what transpired to be the difference between the treaty and the Act? The treaty is a... The, the treaty is a um, it's an agreement between governments. That's the whole point. It's a, and it stays within governments until it's abrogated. As as the United Kingdom, it was, that was exactly the point that the United Kingdom gave, gave. That basically, a treaty is something that you can that the partners in it can choose to to withdraw from. Yeah, and, and is it your view, based on what you just said? that the rhetoric is perhaps flawed, i.e. that one is not asking for independence, one's asking for a re-establishment of what was there before. Really, in a, the referendum would, to my mind, be establishing whether the Scottish people felt that this, um, this, that the, that the, that the, treat, that the present arranged constitutional arrangements, the, current, the present change in the constitutional arrangements of our partnership okay. was such that they, they, they wished to abrogate the treaty. Okay. In other words, it was one step too many. Yeah. And, and you see, it seems to me where, we, where I found what I was looking for really was in the, um, the, the um, evidence that was put to the English government in the um, uh, to back up the Section Thirty thing, they made two claims. They claimed that Scotland was remained a nation, remained a nation, and they claimed that this was a major constitutional change. And it seemed to me that if Scotland remained a nation, there were certain things, powers that it had that were separate. In the first place, it had a, um, the powers that accrue to it um, as a Scottish government acting in its role as the, domestic, as the, the um, democratic government, the duly elected government of a nation, the successors, if you like, of the signatories of the treaty. Okay. And in the second place, were the powers that accrue to it in it acting as its role as a, a partner, a minority partner, in a, a union gov governed by their mutually agreed internal laws. And I think if, if in fact, we've now got evidence that the, the Scottish government don't regard Brexit as being in their interests, I would argue that the Scottish government not only can, but it has a duty to hold a referendum to establish whether this is one change too many and that we should pull out of the arrangement we made 300 years ago. Okay. I mean, some people might say, but hold on a second, this is all well and good. And if that logic had been pursued back in 2014, that might have been the time to do it. But having accepted the conditions of 2014, aren't you pretty much obliged to accept the same conditions the next time round? I don't see why. I mean, the basic, the, the whole base difference in, in, in 2014 was that we were able to take what was quite clearly the simplest way out. Mm. The simplest way out would be to reach agreement within the internal arrangements, which is what we did. Yeah. But what we have now is a two very clear indications from the British government. The first is that they are not going to make that, make that kind of arrangement. So we have to find something, some other way of doing what is the will of the Scottish people? And the the second is that not only um, are they not going to give us a Section 30, but they're not going to do a damn thing about listening to anything we say about anything else. They're going to take powers back from us. They are going to impose powers upon us. And they made that perfectly clear three years ago when they, two, three years ago when they, when they passed the first Brexit bill. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that is I really do criticise the Scottish government for is the fact that with that clear indication 
of what was coming. They did nothing. Yeah. Do you think it was a mistake to oppose Brexit so vehemently uh, when that was clearly the wishes of people in England? Uh, I don't see... I don't see that that is the point. We are, after all, as we've said, if we are partners in the union, we are, I think that we have every right to do it. And certainly I think the Scottish government never uh, in, in its opposition did or said anything which was either untrue or, you know, not well argued and sorted out. Why I see, I think it's it's part and parcel of something that we have to accept yeah. about the relationships between England and and uh, Scotland now. And it makes me very sad to say this as somebody who's born English, that our two societies are moving apart. Yeah. We are, we are, we don't want the same things from our governments. Yeah. And I think that that's true. And why Scotland should not argue for something that's in its interest uh, against something which is based on Prejudice. Yeah. I mean, they got their, they got their, they got their, their, their decision by telling lies and by, and by playing on people's prejudice, bringing out the worst in people. Yeah. Let's move to our question or two, if we may. Anne Smart is asking, why is it that England is much more likely to vote Tory? <laughs> I really don't know since I come from a strong, I come from the east end of London where we don't, we don't have people like, or us, rather we didn't until they started pulling down the docks and building um, executive suites all over the place. But uh, basically, I think it appears, I, I think it appeals to their, their, their sense of importance. It's, it's, I think there's a there's a degree of snobism, I think, but why they do why they do it and why they continue to do it in in against the um, clear indication that the people who are voting for them are going to suffer as a result. Yeah, isn't the explanation? Uh, perhaps I'm being too simplistic here, but as you speak, I'm reminded of a um, a cartoon. Which, uh, in which the king and his advisor are on the ramparts looking over this baying mob, some of whom are carrying pitchforks and others torches. And the king turns to his advisor and said, boy, I, am I in trouble now? And his advisor says, not a bit of it, sir. All you have to do is persuade the guys with the pitchforks that the guys with the, uh, the torches are their enemies and vice versa. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there you are. But I, I think it's I think it's 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 inexplicable. I it, I find it very sad because I'm a I'm a child of the welfare state. I was in the first group of kids who benefited from beverage and went into secondary and in, into grammar schools as of right. And the only way you could get in was by passing the scholarship. And above me, it was all paid people. Yeah. So I mean, I I'm a child of of, of what the Labour Party produced, and it makes me so sad to see that English people have forgotten why these things were put in place. But we went through two world wars, and as a result, the servicemen came back and said, no, we're not going to do things this way anymore. We're going to have it changed. Mm -hmm. And it makes me, well, today's the 11th of, today's the 11th of November, yeah. and it makes me very sad to think that the true memorial to the people who came back from the Second World War was the welfare state. Yeah. and these people <laughs> are just busily destroying that monument whilst yeah. at the same place laying wreaths all over the place. Yeah. Here's a question from Ruth Hanrati, and she's asking, she said, good evening, Dot. What do you make of Alistair Jack's statement at least 40 years before a referendum and then claiming he was only joking? I never listen to anything Alistair Jack says. We'll take the slightest notice of it. <laughs> And I would recommend you to do the same. <laughs> well, that, I think that, that's very good advice. And I think perhaps most of his colleagues take the same view. Uh, if, if some of their private comments are again. Uh, 
coming back now again to your point about uh, the Section 30, because it, it does trouble lots of people. There's no question about that. Uh, uh, the feeling is very much, for many people who feel that, as you do, the Section 30 is, is, is a dead duck. Uh, it, it's never going to be agreed to, and if it is agreed to, it'll be hedged about by so many conditions that it'll be impossible, really, to take it any further. Uh, but so, so what would you contrive to do other than the Section 30? Well, and what would you put in place? Would you simply say to the Scottish government, uh, carry out a referendum and test it? It's like all later. Well, I think I don't think you can do that. I th this, for the simple reason that I don't think that the section of the population which has come over more recently towards them would accept that. But once you get the barrage, thing, you need something with a narrative. It is why I think the treaty route is is the right one. Now, since we started this, I think that's how that would work. So you have a treaty. And you would put it to the people, do you wish to no. abrogate that treaty? Is that what you do? No. no. No, you don't. What you have to accept is that we've found two further strands to the, to the treaty route, which, I mean, there's no reason why you can't, in, in, if we were challenging court, you couldn't raise all three of them. One is the, the one that is being followed by this case at the moment, which is this the, the feeling that it is possible that if you take Article 19 of the treaty, which is the one that gives the independence to um, uh, the, the independent Scottish law system, that that could therefore um, establish that um, enables the Scottish government to act in any way which doesn't breach Scots law. And the other is the possibilities that arose out of the discussions which took place in the House of Commons about the relationship between treaties and international and domestic law and the precedence which treaties takes over them. And I think it will be interesting to see whether that treaty for supremacy, in fact, would apply to our treaty. They were applying it to the Trades Act and to the whole Brexit position. Now, the trouble is there's a downside to this legal approach as there is to almost all of them. Um, and that is that the Scottish claim to nationhood doesn't meet all the criteria which would normally uh, underpin such a claim in international law. I mean, Scotland's position in ceding partial sovereignty to um, is unusual, if, if not unique. And it seems to me that what I want to see out of that is the Scottish government, I think, I think this, this particular route is really worth pursuing. And I think that therefore what I would like to see is the Scottish government going out and tackling the whole thing and seeking, going outside its in-house legal system and going for legal advice in, on constitu in constitutional and international law to see whether the risk, and whatever we do, there's a risk, is at an acceptable level in following this suit. It seems to me that we have to do that, and we have to do it quickly, and I'm sorry we haven't done it before. Well, that, that was a point made by Robin McAlpin, who was concerned when he was a guest on the show, that the whole yes movement had been put in, on ice. Uh, and he, he was also concerned, as you are, that nothing much... And it seems to be happening elsewhere, apart from the focus on a section 30. Uh, you mentioned the, the court case that's going through right now. Are you referring to Martin Keating's work? Mm, yes. I mean, what, 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 what's your opinion of what Martin is doing? Well, I would. I think he's obviously he's working on the one strand that I just mentioned, the, the Article 19. I would be much happier if he broadened it to take in the two aspects that we've, we've mentioned yeah. and, and perhaps um, pin it much more to the, to, to the treaty. In other words, instead of really just pushing one section of the treaty, which I think does leave him possibly open to them saying, oh, precedence of uh, parliament. Yeah. Um, 
if it goes beyond. And for example, if we say we won in the Scottish courts, he won in the Scottish courts and the British government then appealed it. I don't know whether they could, but I'm sure they'd find some way of doing something. Um, and we, uh, so that I would like to see it, it broadened out a bit with a solid opinion behind us about the, the supremacy of the, of the treaty. Yeah. In other words, it, it, it doesn't alter anything he does or change what he's saying. It merely broadens it out and perhaps gives it a bit more depth and a bit more, a bit more, I don't know, a bit more of a narrative somehow. Something you yeah. can sell to the public, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, uh, I know, I know. What you mean. I just, I just wonder. I mean, I'm no legal expert. I hasten to add, but I just wondered if it would be within the legal uh, competence to remit of a Scottish court to uh, come to a view on that. The treaty. Okay. Well, I would. I don't think they would have to. I mean, what I'm saying is that if we got a favourable legal opinion, enough for us to make it, risk it then the government should just do it and wait for it to be challenged by the British government. We yeah. don't have to wait in that case. And that, that is the best. I mean, it's, it's not a very satisfactory start to um, uh, a, a, a start for a nation to have to go and say, please, sir. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I did, I mean, did. <laughs> it, to me, it, um, Yes, I mean, I, I hear lots of people saying what you're saying. I, I think there's a, a considerable degree of support for you in terms of what you've been talking about. One concern I have, of course, is that the UK has no written constitution, which on one hand makes it terribly, much, much easier to come to a, a view on a section 30 and for the two, the two governments to agree, because you don't have to, you're, not, you're not bound by any overarching legislation. The, the governments can make it up as they go along. But ah. equally, equally <laughs> if there is no written constitution, it's open to the overarching authority to create one. And I, I often worry that uh, by not being assertive, if I can use that term in, in this setting, that and leaving uh, the momentum on the other side, that it leaves it open, for example, for the Westminster government to say, we're going to have a written constitution, and article number one will be borrowed from the Spanish constitution which says that the territorial integrity of the UK is sacrosanct. Yeah, but they can't say that to another treaty partner. <laughs> really? That's between the, the, using the treaty and the Act. Under the Act, you have absolutely... Yeah. If you only go on the Act, if you only work on the role of the Scottish Government within the, uh, within the, the, the domestic arrangements, if you like, that we, that we set up under the Act, then you are perfectly right. And we saw that. They can do. They wouldn't even need to go to a, a further constitution. They would have to. They would only need to have retrospective legislation or intervening legislation, as they did with the with the Brexit Act. Yeah. Um, and so, as long as you're going down, but if you if you set your mark on the treaty and your your status as a nation then, in fact, that gets over that business. And, in fact, I think they are aware of that because, if you notice, there have been quite a lot of rumblings about altering the Act of Union itself. Yeah. And I think they're aware of that. I, this is why I'm so keen on, on pushing the treaty because it takes us away from those things. The difficulty is that we've got to be clear that the claim for nationhood yeah. has a basis in international law, which is why I say, for goodness sake, get off your bottoms and go and find out. Yeah. So you, you're in a, a, a pivotal position. You're on the NEC. So often has this subject or similar subjects been discussed on the NEC? It hasn't. It hasn't? No, not in the time I've been there. None of it? No, not at all. The only discussion of the... Um, of the uh, independence came on the day after Nicola's press conference at which she said that we weren't going for a referendum in 2020. And she came to us on the following morning to more or less repeat what she'd said to the press. And uh, the only thing that came out of that was that 
I was distinctly frozen out when I raised my theory of, 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 of working up the developing the idea of nationhood and constitutional major constitutional change. And uh, during the course of discussion with others, she expressed the opinion that she thought that Boris Johnson would end up being morally obliged to give in. I'm not making any more comment. <laughs> It's, a, it's a, a somewhat courageous uh, approach to assume that Boris Johnson has any morals, but, uh, but uh, given that, uh, perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps uh, his actions are driven by uh, a deep sense of moral integrity. It just hasn't been evident to many of us as yet. Um, but leaving that aside, that's the only time that, that you have discussed independence at the yeah. No, we, have, we haven't discussed anything except the selection procedures for the Holyrood election. And I mean, no campaign, no campaign discussion, nothing except the selection procedures in so various forms or another and the timetable which they should follow. And that's what we have done for the whole of, well, we didn't have, we, the first two, we had no meetings in November. We had a, didn't have a meeting in December, which is, I may say, against the Constitution. We then had meetings in January and February. Uh, there was then a, a reasonable break because of the, the, the coronavirus. Yeah. And then we started having virtual meetings. We missed one in, I think it was August. Yeah. Um, and basically, we... That was it. We, we, until the last meeting where we did some housekeeping and things like that, but basically the major subject was what they called the equalities mechanisms and the, the, what I would regard as the, NEC, the, the various arrangements which the NEC would make to interfere with the choice of, 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 of um, CA selection. What do you make of that? I think I'd rather not say. <laughs> I don't know what Peter's people's motives are. Yeah. I find it. I find it very upsetting. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I've got over some of the shock, but yeah. I still find it very, very upsetting. So, if, if if the NEC, as you say, has behaved unconstitutionally, who is responsible for upholding the constitution? The the secretary. Well, rather, he's not responsible for it. We're all responsible for ensuring that the Constitution is followed. But he is the guardian, I suppose you might say, within the party, I would say, of the, of the Constitution, and it would be his job to see that it was adhered to and certainly to answer questions when questioned by other members of the NEC as to the constitutionality of various actions, which yeah. I have done and been ignored. I sent six letters to him and to the convener on the subject of the dual mandate, and I never got a single reply. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't go into motivations. Yeah. I really don't know. I just, I, I'm, I'm working on the practicalities that I find it totally unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, both the servicing of the NEC and the agendas, the quality of discussion and all the rest of it. Who sets the agenda? Hmm? Who sets the agenda? A good question. It appeared, <laughs> it appeared with no minutes. It appeared usually, uh, the meetings were usually set a week beforehand, not at the end. Things improved slightly in the servicing after, after Keith's um, committee was set up. We actually got minutes all the way back to January. We had no minutes. We had our papers. I had, I had the papers on the uh, finance. I had the, the, the party's accounts for 2019. When I got up on the Sunday morning, um, about sort of half past eight, and went through and found them on my computer for a meeting at five o'clock in the afternoon. Now I take time with accounts. I'm not. I'm not 
uh, or particularly good. I mean, I can work it out, but I need time. And um, that was it. I didn't get it. Yeah. It does sound very odd. Um, I'm not a member of the SNP, but, uh, but I would have thought that things would have been done in a slightly more organised way. But uh, So what is your view? I mean, are, uh, I gather NEC elections are coming up soon. Are you? Well, yes. I mean, what I did, um, it was it was the thing that really got me was the fact of not getting any. I rose during the course of the three the the years I was there. I wrote three on three topics. None of them, I would say, were were ones which um, were unimportant. They couldn't be dismissed as trivial. Uh, the and the the. One was to move the. One was the question I've just raised of the dual mandate, where I was so angry because maybe it's my imagination, but I felt that I had been manipulated into a position where I had to vote in a way that wasn't a constitutional, certainly wasn't thing. We had a closed ballot, and the way it was set up. I just felt that I was, I felt it was arranged. I can't prove it. I can't prove it at all. But you know, you can get into a meeting, you get the feel of it. And and it was... It, People in the audience who might not know, what is the dual mandate? The dual mandate was the, the sudden idea that the fact that if an MP or an MSP wanted to change between parliaments, there might be an overlapping period when they were members of both. I mean, I know Alec did it. I can only say that my experience of it, as far as he was concerned, that it never seemed to interfere with his ability to do his his constituency duties on on either basis, and I know that he donated one of his salaries to uh, to charity. So that there really wasn't. Uh, he was the most. I think the most. There was a lot at the time of the of the putting up of the Scottish Parliament, but that was just you know temporary. But he did it, and and I can't see that it caused the slightest problem. It certainly didn't bother the electorate. Yeah. Because he, he he upped his upped his majority by twenty percent, so obviously, however much, and one of the arguments was uh, that was given for the for for stopping this and saying that uh, um, that uh, members should not be allowed to do it was that there had been criticism of it when Alec did it. Well, there was very strong criticism. It all came from the Conservative candidate, whom he eventually de defeated. Yeah. But there was no, there was certainly. I was on, the, I was on the committee at the time, and, and there was no, um, no criticism from inside the party whatsoever. So why did you feel that this move was unconstitutional? Because of the way the vote was taken. Um, basically, I was suddenly I found myself instead of being faced with. Um, uh, there were six proposals in front of us on the uh, 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 on the. Um, agenda in varying degrees of being rather appalling to totally appalling. And um, there were two that I would go along with, one which was to, to, to say nothing, to just keep it the way it is. And the second was my own uh, amendment where I tried to take, uh, take account of people uh, people who genuinely didn't like the... the, the um, the idea of a, of, a, of an MP trying to do two jobs. Uh, I mean, I know one of my quite close colleagues has always been opposed to it. And uh, I, what I put in was that they would do that, but it would be on the honest. They could, they could, they could uh, take a, a, another seat, but it would be on the understanding that at the first election that came up, they would have to make a choice. And I thought that went at least some way to meet the uh, the views of people who didn't like this so this cover. But in fact, what happened was that there was a very artificial, um, su made su artificially made suggestion that some uh, that we should have a, a, a vote. It wouldn't be they wouldn't be comfortable with people knowing how they voted. And given the result, I'm not really surprised, but there you are. The, 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 um, I tried, we were told that we mustn't, we were told that we mustn't um, 
uh, vote on personalities. Uh, we must vote on principle. And I, and that we weren't to discuss it. And I broke that. And I said, look, you can't do that. You know perfectly well that there is a, a, a pending um, fight between two quite major figures in the party yeah. and it's already attracted media choice yeah. people are already taking sides and that anything we do is you you cannot remain neutral you're going to be seen as 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 whether you like it or not the yeah. situation is such that you cannot avoid being seen to take sides yeah. and so you should leave it alone yeah. and the next thing i knew was that they had decided to have the the secret ballot, and as a result of having a secret ballot, they did it under STV instead of doing it, the single transferable vote, instead of doing it as we always do at conference and in resolutions, a conference and anything like this on a straight yes, no. We should have gone straight the way through. What I found when I had the thing up in front of me was that there was no ability not to vote for one of the <laughs> you, you couldn't vote zero against anything. Yeah. And so I had to put a figure against things which I totally and utterly disagreed with for no other reason that I was being asked to vote uh, in a way that I would never have conceived that we could vote. And I don't think it was constitutional. I, I really don't think that you vote. You couldn't. I mean, you don't vote on STV for conference resolutions. And this, is, uh, this was the same sort of thing. There were also quite a lot of views expressed that it wasn't a matter for us to discuss at all, that it would be. If, if, if they decided to do it, it was a matter, it should be a matter for, for conference. But all that went by the board and we were faced with this STV thing. And some of my votes must have gone against things that I find totally, utterly unacceptable. Yeah. And I queried it with the... With the, with the um, National Secretary, yeah. and I wrote, I wrote on, I wrote six letters in all. And the last one was not just a query; it was asking for, um, complaining about not receiving a reply from either the convener. And so I raised it at the committee, and I was, I, I received an apology for not replying. But no reply. Okay. I don't, still don't know whether it's constitutional. It was not my job to find out, but it was my job to try and see. I, I, I found it totally unacceptable, and it was quite certainly manipulated. Yeah. There was only doubt about that. Yeah. I can't prove it. If I could prove it, I'd have done more about it, but I couldn't. Yeah. Are, are you standing again for the NEC? Yes, I am. Hmm. Um, whether, <laughs> whether I should be um, ele elected, people, I... I didn't find it easy to go public. Um, I was trained in the old and uh, old SNP, where whatever you, however fights you had inside, you never took outside. And I know that there are people who agreed with my dislike, with what they disagreed with what I was describing, but who still thought that I shouldn't have gone public. And to a certain extent, neither did I. But on the other hand, had I not gone public. The members wouldn't have known what was going on, and I, it. If in fact the confidentiality thing is being used to behave in a way that we would not behave if it was exposed to to, to scrutiny, then I think it's a form of blackmail. And I felt, rightly or wrongly, that I had to come out and and shine a light on it. And it has in fact drawn members' attention to it. And I think there's been more, um, more discussion in the last, since I did it, there's been a lot of discussion amongst members about the Constitution. They've realised that the Constitution and the closed sessions where the Constitution is sorted out are not things that you go and have a, have a, have a, a cup of coffee with your mates and a chat because it really isn't frightfully important and it's all very boring and they've realised that it's important. And I think there's a result. There have been a lot of resolutions that have been put together. I know I've, I've helped people. I've had people come to me and, and, and ask 
you know, how to do resolutions. And I've been able to refer to them to the excellent book that the political party, party has about it. Yeah. But they have been. And there have also been people taking a lot of, of interest in, in, the, in who's standing. And I, that's, a, that's a very good thing. Yeah, well, that's, that does sound good. I mean, it's, it, it, people should be active when it comes to these matters. And in fact, all voting matters. It's not, it doesn't do anyone any good for people to be passive when it comes to these things or any, any sort of election. Otherwise, if people had been passive, they said people would not be sitting where it's sitting today. No, no indeed. It's, 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 I mean, it, it, I'm standing again, and I'm standing again quite basically to, to hoping I will get enough colleagues on the on the um, on the NEC that I will get elected and there will be enough other people of a like thinking to bring the party back to behaving strictly within the constitution I mean it, it's it, it's a sort of sliding thing it's like uh, for example we're not having we don't get amendments there's not amendments to the resolutions we were asked for feedback. Now, feedback isn't covered by the Constitution, but resolutions are, and it's a sort of sliding thing. And I, I just, um, I want to see it brought back within the law. I want to see the National Secretary doing his job of ensuring that everything is, is dealt with through standing orders, through the arrangements, and if we want to change them, we go to conference and we ask them and we get a proper decision on it. Uh, that's that. I want to see the independence, the independence thing moved on. There's a suggestion uh, that uh, we would set up a group within the uh, within the NEC, and we have the expertise there. I mean, at the moment, I mean, there's Alan Smith, there's Joanne Cherry, who are more than capable of assessing a legal thing and making the case and talking talking to Mike and getting a legal opinion so that we can see what the what the, the factual situ assessment is of our legal position if we go and 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 just go ahead and do it under our under the sort of circumstances I'm talking about. That's the second thing I want to do. Um, a faint heart never won a fair lady, did it? <laughs> so, so looking forward more generally, we, we've only got about eight minutes left. I, I did warn you that these 60 minutes go very fast. <laughs> um, it, your assessment, please, of the, of the future, what do you think next year will bring for the independence movement? I, I don't know. I think if we get our fingers out and, and sort out, there's a whole lot of divisive issues at the moment going on. All of them are perfectly... There's the finance thing. There's the fallout from Alex's case. There's a whole lot of other things. All of these things are causing problems and have got to be stopped. And the way to stop them is to tackle them. You, yeah. You've got a mess. You don't leave it and hope it'll go away. And you certainly don't leave it and hope it'll go away and then find it's still there two weeks before in a major election. Yeah. So I, I think that that's something that's got to be tackled. I would hope that what we would also do is set up um, – uh, set up a um, uh, a proper campaign, campaign program and strategy group under the whoever turns out to be the organisation convener. Um, I know there have been grassroots uh, people who have actually produced a, a professional program for that, with various bits sorted into it. Um, I think it'll probably have to be have to be dumbed down a little bit for. Uh, for the CAs, uh, it's all right for somebody like me because it was, you know, it was my job too. I can read it, but it's a bit complicated, I think. But nevertheless, it's the, it's, it's the way to do it. It's a proper strategy. I would hope that what we would do is spend the whole of next year on campaigning in one way or another. And we have to think also, we've got to, we've got to think of new ways of campaigning. If we've got if we've got the virus, we've got to we've got to find ways around it. It's a, you know, it's a problem, and you can't just sit there and say, "Well, we're not going to campaign. We rely on the polls." I mean, anybody who relies on the polls, in my opinion, is a fool. But I mean, it, it's it's uh, um, we've got to find new ways of doing things. And I would hope 
that we would come up with a strategy, come up with ideas, and go out and have a long period through next year of campaigning on um, an information basis, of trying to tackle what I've been tackling on the stall for the last eight years, which is the basic ignorance of, 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 the, of the public. Tackle that and then have a fast, very sharp, final beat up to a, a, a referendum campaign. Uh, either in the autumn of next year, this year, or early spring, because we've got a hell of a lot of work to do. I mean, I, I, any reason I would say for putting it off, I think it comes back to Edith Steele's question, um, any reason for putting off a, a, camp, a, a referendum, to my mind, has to be, it's, it's practical rather than theoretical. It's a question of can we get the work done in time, uh, in the time. Well, it, it behooves the organisation that wants change to make sure it's in a position to effect and address that change. There's no question about that. Um, I, I'd like to get your views very quickly on a comment made by our guest last week, Andy McIver. And, uh, and Andy was very trenchant in his comments. I asked him um, how did he feel that... that, that the way that the unionists and the conservatives in particular were, uh, uh, were, were tackling the whole question of independence. And his answer slightly surprised me. He said, well, the response, is almost, the response of the Tories towards independence is almost entirely emotional. And my counterpoint was, to which he agreed, uh, that's the way to lose. Uh, <laughs> if you go forward with an emotional argument, uh, and the other guy, woman, has a strategic view and a clear set of tactics, then the likelihood is that a clear strategy is going to win every time. And he agreed with that. He said, yeah, yeah. That's it. So in many ways, you know, it does look like if there is to be a referendum, it's the independence movements uh, to lose rather than to win. In other words, the winning is almost there. Uh, it's a question of being coherent, perhaps. What, what do you think of his argument that the conservative opposition is entirely emotional? I think that I think that the attitude of uh, the Conservative Party of English people to many subjects is entirely emotional. They do not have a realistic assessment of their own position in the world. You've only got to see it the way they voted on Brexit. They didn't vote on facts. They voted on they voted on their feelings that they mattered and that they could stand alone. And they didn't quite say that they could go on sending gunboats to people who are upset them as they did in the Victorian times. But that was the general idea. I mean, you actually have people saying Ireland should we should solve the Irish problem by them coming back inside inside the United Kingdom. I mean, how unrealistic can you get? So I think that that's true. It's part of this this belief in themselves as they were, instead of looking to what they could make themselves in the future. And they are a great country and they, they could do so much, but they're not. They're looking backwards, not forwards. So I think he's right. And I don't think it only applies to the Constitution. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we're almost at the end. I think we should uh, say thank you very much for that. Though. It's been very enlightening. A big thank you to you. Uh, and a big thank you to all of you out there for watching and listening tonight. Uh, as we say before, we do it for you, The Nation Talks. Uh, and as ever, we had again a formidable list of guests lined up. Next week is another cracking show when The Nation Talks to Kenny Farquharson, Times columnist Kenny Farquharson, who, as you know, is an award-winning journalist. So get your questions for Kenny in now and join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for The Nation Talks to Kenny Farquharson. Oh, by the way, please look out for the Constitution column in the Sunday National this weekend. It's written by my colleague, Dr. Elliot Boomer, and, and he'll be looking at how colonies are treated. If you're not in a union, maybe you're a colony, and how do colonies get treated? How has the London government treated uh, colonies in the past? And are there pointers for us there? You'll find the Constitution column, by the way, in the seven days supplement in the Sunday National. Uh, oh, and very importantly, please support Indie Live and Indie Live Radio. They're there for you. 
It's the alternative media. It's your media. And I want to underscore this. The audio versions of this show, the TNT show, are also broadcast on Indie Live Radio. And they're available on demand on Indie Live Radio's podcast and YouTube channels. Indie Live Radio also has a fantastic selection of Scottish, Gaelic music, rock, pop, folk and jazz. Uh, so tune in to Indie Live. That's a solid plug. You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain by giving them a try. And I would appreciate it if you did that. Well, thank you and good night and join us next Wednesday. And remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. Good night all. Big thank you to Dot again. Good night. See you next week. Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net, or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have. There's something for everyone. Our newest on-demand platform is Indie Live Radio's YouTube channel. We've set up playlists for our most popular shows and current topics, currency, disc parties. New content is added almost daily, so subscribe and you won't miss anything. Join us. Thanks for listening. Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net, or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. And to me, that's the clear blue water between staying in the UK and going for independence. It's clear, regardless of what Boris Johnson said the other day, that they will want to go back to business as usual, where the ultra rich are the ones who gain from everything. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be part of that. We want the chance to actually build a fairer country. But I don't think anybody who has gone over to yes now is really for moving, because I think they can see clear as day what things look like. And I always felt that during the independence referendum that it would take a no vote in order for a lot of Scots to realise the consequences of voting no. They would have to see what happens when they vote no in order to realise what a mistake it was.
watch this again, you'll be part of it. It's Independence Live. Yeah, a few people asked about YouTube. It'll be YouTube forward slash Independence Live. That's where you'll find the footage. Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net, or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. Here we are, it's the Yakin Bridge where we started the first 500 miles uh, in front of that beach there. This is where it all started. We're now in day four and uh, we're heading towards Portree. We'll see he's on the road, sign the covenant. Long walk to freedom. Talk to you later. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. It's a song we wrote about five minutes ago called Carpe Diem. Hope over fear. Are you threatened by words from an empire of money and gold? Will you chain in your country's potential for the lies you've been sold? Are you scared that the walls are too high to be breached by the bold? Will you stand and be counted or shut up and do what you're told? Hope over fear, don't be afraid Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave Will you seize the day? Rip the chains from the unicorn, Scotland's no longer your slave. Let the TV man call you a nationalist for rejecting the lies. Ha. 
of the wards of the view of the ball Cause he wears shorts and ties When they tell you that Scotland's no great Are you really surprised? Will you stand and be counted for something that money can't buy? Hope over fear Don't be afraid Scotland's no longer your slave Carpe diem Will you seize the day Rip the chains from the unicorn Scotland's no longer your slave on the climb Fighting wars for the wealth of the few How many have died You can bury my bones For the truth of it can't be denied Will you stand and be counted Cos I'll be there stood by your side Hope over fear don't be afraid The Westminster Tories of Scotland's no longer your slave Can't be the end Will you seize the day Rip the chains from the unicorn Scotland's no longer your slave Will the media tell you that England don't want you to go And the taxpayer funded MPs Tell you just tell them no No But in Manchester, Nottingham, Sheffield They already know And they're fighting for them And it's only the start of the show Ha <laughs> ha Hope over peace Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave Can't be the end My friend, will you seize the day? With the chains from the unicorn Scotland's no longer your slave Oh yes Ha <laughs> ha!